You know, the one thing about the Super Bowl is that you're always home. I would, I think I can go out on a limb and say this. You're guaranteed to, to see something about Jesus there. There's going to be somebody there that's going to hold up the sign that says John 3, 16. There's going to be somebody there that's going to be, that's going to kneel to pray. There's going to be somebody there. That you're, you're going to get some view of Jesus. In the course of this series, we've been asking the question, who is Jesus, and have said uh, quite rightly that the answer to that question is one of the most important answers that you'll ever give in your life. Because not only does the answer to that question guide and direct your life this side of heaven, but it guides and directs and points you to the life forever uh, with, with Jesus. And uh, last week we said that uh, Jesus is leader. That's what we, what we filled in the blank with. And one of the things that we said is that people can't follow our intentions, but people can follow our actions. And we looked at some ways in which Jesus demonstrates leading and, and how he shows us and even goes along with us as we lead others. And our challenge last week was simple, but yet I think still challenging. I asked you to identify something that needs to change as you follow Jesus. And then in identifying that one thing, then also ask someone to hold you accountable in making the changes or whatever change it was that you needed to make. And so I'll just ask you rhetorically, how's it going? And also I'll say that as you have been going along making that change, probably you found it to be a little difficult. Perhaps maybe you got tripped up along the way somewhere. Maybe perhaps you saw that, that easy street sign, you know, on next left or next exit that we had up there last week, and you took it. And yet today as you come here and as we began our worship time together today, we heard the call of God to say, come back onto the road that I'm on. I'll give you my forgiveness and I'll walk with you. Let's go do this together. Follow my lead. So Jesus is leader, and today we want to wind up our series today by talking about uh, how Jesus is fully man. Fully man. Fully man so that he can also be fully our Savior. And so today, I'm going to let you know right up front that this message is going to be somewhat of a teaching message somewhat of a review kind of message, but I pray that most of all this message will be one in which will draw you into a deeper trust of Jesus, fully man and fully God as Savior, who is your advocate through life, and so that you won't listen to your accuser, Satan. So in order to do that today, um, don't anybody go to sleep, okay? I'm going to try to make this engaging and exciting because we're going to do a little catechetical review here. Go back to the catechism, okay? Luther's small catechism. By the way, that is what the catechism looks like now for those of you who are like me, and it's been like 37 years ago that you were in 7th and 8th grade catechism class. You know, the catechism is, uh, that word means a book of instruction, and it's a simple way to instruct us in the main teachings of the Bible, the six main teachings of the Bible. Can you name them? The Apostles' Creed, the Ten Commandments, Lord's Prayer, Office of the Keys, and the Two Sacraments, Baptism and Holy Communion. See, you did good. You did better than you thought you were going to. I know, I know. You're, some of you are going, oh, gosh, I can't remember. Yeah, you're okay. You're okay. Yeah. 
Another challenge for today is to find that book. Find that book. See, mine was blue. You know, I don't know what color yours was. Some people said there's a green. Some said there's a black. I guess it depends on how old you are, perhaps, what color your catechism uh, is. Uh, I remember also getting one when I was a kid that was uh, a white paperback about the size of your palm that I had in my desk because I went, was fortunate to go to a Lutheran school. And, and that's where yeah, you whip that thing out a lot. Uh, so go get that. Read through it. Especially this part that we're going to talk about today about in the second article of the Apostles' Creed about Jesus being fully, fully man as well as fully God. And I'm going to take us right there to the, to the uh, second article of the Apostles' Creed. So now, just kind of, I want to encourage you to just kind of take this in. I mean, really, as hard as it may be, or as challenging as it may be, really let this sink in. And maybe for some of you, it will be so much ingrained in your mind by memory that, that you kind of just go on past it. Don't do that today. Really let it sink in about what it is that we confess about Jesus Christ in the second article of the Apostles' Creed. This is the explanation. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil. Not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own, and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Just as he is risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, this is most certainly true. I don't know about you, but I read that this week about three times out loud. And I think I slowed down every time that I read it more so than I did the time before. And there were times that it just kind of stopped me in my tracks to really comprehend that my Jesus, my, my God, became fully human, just as much as you and I are fully human here today, yet without sin, he was. And Luther goes on, or the explanation of the catechism goes on into uh, uh, this next question. You can find this. It says, how do you know that Jesus Christ is also true man? Well, the answer is this. Because the scriptures, A, clearly call him man. In, in 1 Timothy, it says, There is only one God and there is only one go-between for God and human beings. He is the man, Christ Jesus. And then the second part of that answer is, Because the scriptures say that he has a human body and soul. Luke 24, look at my hands and my feet, Jesus says. It is really I. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have a body or bones, but you can see that, that I do. And also in, in Matthew 26, then he said to them, this is Jesus speaking, my soul is very sad. I feel close to death. Stay here. Keep watch with me. And then the third part of that answer Part C is because the scriptures speak of his human but sinless feelings and actions. Got some, three references. Matthew 4. After 40 days and 40 nights of going without eating, Jesus was hungry. 
I would have been hungry after six hours, maybe less. Later, Jesus said, I am thirsty. Might have been more thirsty than hungry. Jesus sobbed. Not just cried, but sobbed. Just a few examples of his, his very human feelings and actions, yet without sin. And then there's the second question. Why was it necessary for our Savior to be true man? The answer Christ had to be true man in order to act in our place under the law and fulfill it for us. That's what we all, that's what a lot of us learned who have been in catechism classes called his active obedience. Bet it's been a lot of years that you've heard that term, the active obedience. And, and, and a reference for that from Romans 5 because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners, but because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. That one person was. Jesus. And then the second part of that answer, Christ had to be true man in order to be able to suffer and die for our guilt because we failed to keep the law. That's known as his passive obedience. Okay? And Hebrews 2. We'll look at that. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood, for only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. You just had a crash course in catechism, second article, Jesus, true man. And in a way, and also to help us kind of really let this sink in about the God of the universe becoming human being and being a sinless human being and, and, and carrying out his active obedience and passive obedience in our place as human, I, I, I want to share with you a part of how kind of Max Lucado helps us to see this and the real depth of it and, and the reality of it all. In his book, uh, God Came Near, I want to I want to share this with you. So, uh, if it helps you to, now I know I told you not to go to sleep. Hopefully, you're still with me. But if it helps you to close your eyes a little bit as I read this, I'll try to make it a, an engaging reading. Okay. But really, let this sink in. Kind of the same way I asked you to let the second article, the explanation, sink in with you too today. I'm going to pick it up where he says, Angels watched as Mary changed God's diaper. (laughs) It just kind of floors you, doesn't it? The universe watched with wonder as the Almighty learned to walk. Children played in the street with him. And his mom probably said, Get out of the street, Jesus! No. And had the synagogue leader in Nazareth known who was listening to his sermons. (laughs) Jesus may have had pimples. He may have been tone deaf. Perhaps a girl down the street had a crush on him or vice versa. It could be that his knees were bony. One thing's for sure. He was, while completely divine, completely human. For 33 years, he would feel everything you and I have ever felt. He felt weak. He grew weary. He was afraid of failure. He was susceptible to wooing women. He got colds. He burped and had body odor. His feelings got hurt. His feet got tired. And his head ached. To think of Jesus in such a light is, well, it seems almost irreverent, doesn't it? It's not something we like to do because it's uncomfortable. It is much easier to keep the humanity out of the incarnation. Clean the manure from around the manger, right? Wipe the sweat out of his eyes. Pretend he never snorted or blew his nose or hit his thumb with a hammer. It's easier to stomach that way. There's something about keeping him divine that keeps him distant, packaged, and predictable. 
but don't do it. For heaven's sake, don't do it. Let him be as human as he intended to be. Let him into the mire and muck of our world, for only if we let him in can he pull us out. Listen to him. Love your neighbor was spoken by a man whose neighbors tried to kill him. The challenge to leave family for the gospel was issued by one who kissed his mother goodbye in the doorway. Pray for those who persecute you came from the lips that would soon be begging God to forgive his murderers. I am with you always are the words of a God who in one instant did the impossible to make it all possible for you and me. It all happened in a moment. In one moment, a most remarkable moment, the Word became flesh. And there will be another. The world will see another instantaneous transformation. Because you see, in becoming man, God made it possible for man to see God. You know, for me, I think one of the times, or many times in our lives where the fact that Jesus is fully human, by the way, still to this day, comes into play so importantly and incredibly in the times of our lives where we face tragedy, where we face the unexpected where we have more questions than answers, where we're dealing with suffering and hardship. Because it's in those moments that the accuser comes right by our side to say, don't trust in those promises. He's a God far off. Look at what's happening around you. If God really loved you, if God really said, you've heard him, haven't you? Why couldn't God just this once? And you fill in the blank. Trying to silence the words of our advocate of Jesus, fully God, yet fully human. I want to share with you in closing today a video by Christian recording artist Big Daddy Weave. I know it sounds kind of a weird for a, for a group, but aren't, isn't that the way rock groups are? You know, Stone Temple Pilots. What in the world is that, you know? It's kind of how they are. It's how they roll. But I want to share with you the, the story behind the song, Jesus, I Believe. You'll see the video in a few moments, but I want, to, want you to know that the people in the video aren't just actors. They're real people who had experienced tragedy, suffering, hardship at its most ugliest. You'll see in the video a young woman, her name, real name is Angel Whitlow, She had experienced uh, an intruder breaking into her home one night as her husband uh, heard and got up trying to defend his family. He was shot and killed by that intruder right in her own bedroom. And she went through a time of asking all of those questions. How, why, what now? And talks about, talks about how having a God who 
understands and goes through suffering and tragedy pulled her out of the darkness that the accuser Satan was trying to keep her in. The group says this about the, about the song. I'll just share this with you before we look at it. We wrote the song, Jesus, I Believe, because we were standing with people every night who had been given really a terrifying dif- diagnosis. That diagnosis became their identity. And so when we went to make a video for this song, we wanted it to be about causing hope to rise in people. The video is basically the story of a young lady who receives the diagnosis and they begin to pray and believe and trust the Lord. And then he says, my favorite part of the video is when she gets the good word from the doctor and the look on her face that really says it all. And God is who he says he is. And we trust in him no matter what. We have a God who understands what we go through. People in the video are not actors. They're just people who had been through some of the most honestly terrible things I've ever heard of. But because of how they encountered God in the middle of it, they're here today to to encourage other people going through things because of the hope that they have found. Here's the video, Jesus, I Believe. Oh, 
you have a Savior who understands fully what you go through. Fully God, yet fully human, who comes alongside you through all the seconds of your life to hold you, to love you, to strengthen you, to lead you, to befriend you, and most of all, to save you. You know, there are many other religions in the world, but, but only one has a, has a Savior. And that's the Christian religion. Only one in which the deity becomes one of the creation in order to save them. So the challenge for us this week is this. Trust in your advocate, not your accuser. Trust in Jesus, fully God, fully human, your advocate, and not your accuser, Satan. And that line in that song, even the impossible is your reality. And it's yours too in Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you this day that we have a Savior in Jesus who was fully human yet without sin for our sake. And fully God so he could pay the price for our sin that would be acceptable to you, our Heavenly Father. So that we can see you with our own eyes. That we can, we can have a future hope that is sure and certain, one without the effects of sin with you face to face. Lord, as we move through the seasons of life and the moments of life that, that sometimes our accuser brings to light that we shouldn't trust in your promises, shouldn't trust in your word based on those circumstances, call us out of that darkness through Jesus. Remind us of the truth of your reality, not the accusers. The accuser has been defeated. You are the victor. And through faith in Jesus, we are victorious as well and will forever be.